<laughs> Roger is uh, from the uh, from I think you Jian Feng's uh, team uh, used to be yes. uh, work with uh, Harry. I think uh, he work and he 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 you were postdoc at the uh, UMH, right? He yeah, you're still Michigan. from the University of Irvine, right? From California. Uh, uh, Irvine. Irvine, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, you guys can, you know, can establish some collaborations. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's a lot of different opportunities in China compared to this. Okay. okay. <laughs> So, so for how long will we'll you present? Still have a few minutes. Uh, I think and probably it will take like forty-five to fifty minutes. Okay, uh, got it. Yeah. So we will start five minutes later, right? Yeah, yeah. I just uh, need to put your up uh, your CVs so that okay, I can Okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Mm. When did you graduate from from Penn State? Me? Uh, yeah. Last year, 2020. 2020? Yeah. Okay, you just, just graduated. Yeah. Okay. Freshly graduated. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's tough. So when did we start this series of talk, this series of seminar? <clears throat> I think there it's already the fourteenth, if I don't remember. If yeah, I yeah, yeah, I think uh, more than how many months? Ten months, something like eight months at least. Okay. Eight, six or eight months. I uh, more than half a year. Okay. Yeah, we, we just wanted to see uh, the, we just invited people who can share their experience um, and how to use the reinforced learning to solve the real problems. We think this oh, okay. pro topic will okay. become more and more important than before, given the fact that and uh, the, the cloud computing and the, all these kinds of IoT, this kind of technology development, so that we can connect to more special type of data in different market. And uh, given these factors, I think the reinforced learning will become a very standard tools for optimizing different strategies in different areas. I think of this kind of, the, uh, I think of the before most of the people just uh, play with uh, these kind of uh, games, these type of things, because you can connect tons of data. But but now I think uh, reinforcing will become more and more important. Yeah, Given, sure. Yeah. Um, So what's the general audience for this series of talk? Uh, I think we, we broadcast in China. I think most of the audience are from China. Okay. And Our, uh, it's every time it's around 500 to 1,000, depends on the speakers. Oh. Yeah, yeah I think uh, we're broadcasting in Bini Bini, so that uh, I think uh, and most uh, audience is uh, from China. Okay, okay, I see.
那个杨月，那个现在现在已经。那个 ，please give me the problem, sir.、Right? Can we start? Oh,、uh, we could start now. I think the Billy Billy is setting up, and it 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 won't hurt if we start now. This is setting up, or it's not on yet. Uh, oops. Uh, the students for setting up Billy Billy said that Billy Billy system is. Uh, updating the system and it can't start now. Maybe we could wait a little bit for the Bilibili, or just we start it and then upload a video to Bilibili. You cannot start today. It could start in a little while, but not now. Okay, but I will just watch. Um, I think a good uh, good afternoon, and、uh, good night, and good morning, everyone. And、uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce、uh, today's speaker, uh, Professor Guang Jiezhen. And Professor Guang Jiezhen is an assistant professor at、uh, John Hopcroft、uh, Center. At Shanghai Jiao Tong University, he, he just graduated from the Penn State in 2020. His research interests lie in the reinforcement learning and the spatial temporal data mining. His recent work focuses on how to learn the optimal strategies for city-level traffic coordination from the multimodal data. He has published more than 20 papers on the top tier of the conferences. And such as KDD, WWW, W and Triple AI and ICD and the CIKM.、Uh, welcome, Guangjie. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, uh, Dr. Zhu, for this introduction. Uh, well, hello, everyone. I'm Guangjie Zhong from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, today I'm going to share with you about the topic improving urban traffic signal control with reinforcement learning. Oops. Okay. So before I get started into the con content,、uh, I want to briefly discuss why we finally come to this question. So actually, in the first few years of my PhD study, actually、uh, we are collaborating with a lot of、uh, data scientists. Or domain scientists from other perspective like geoscience,、uh, we are working on a lot of problems that is describing or trying to diagnose the problem. For example, we try to find out、uh, what is happening、uh, in Pennsylvania、uh, about the groundwater because a lot of people they complain that the groundwater is contaminated by the shale gas. Uh, this is more like a descriptive study or diagnostic study. Basically, we want to find out whether it is contaminated and why it is contaminated.、Uh, after that, we've been doing a lot of work on predictive analytics.、Uh, for example, traffic prediction.、Uh, I know、uh, this problem is kind of well studied in the recent several years.、Mm. So basically, what you want to do is Uh, you want to predict the future traffic based on the current observation. But after doing these studies, we've been thinking about、uh, even though we can do this prediction or this pre、uh, description very accurately, we still cannot change anything. That is why our domain experts keep asking that. So. What should we do to improve this? What should we do to mitigate the traffic congestion, or what should we do to change this、uh, groundwater pollution? That's why we come into prescriptive analytics.、Uh, I know that a lot of people here today、uh, may have some experience of doing reinforcement learning study. So that's also why we want to use reinforcement learning for our study. So today, what I want to 
describe here is basically about these four steps, but I will focus more on uh, the second, third, and the last one. So before trying to solve this problem, we usually need to first define what is this problem and what is our objective. So for so many years, we have been collecting the traffic data. Uh, no matter it is using the traditional devices like the loop sensor or relatively modern devices like the cameras installed at the intersections and the speed data collected from the map services. So all this traffic data have been collected, but they are not well used to improve our traffic. So about three years ago, actually we raised up this question, can we use this traffic data to control the traffic signal? Actually, traffic signal control is a traditional problem in transportation field. They have been investigating this for at least 30 years. Uh, so the traditional transportation methods, usually they make decision based on assumptions. What they do is that they actually try to first assume there is a traffic model that can describe the traffic in the city. And then they convert this tra uh, traffic signal control problem into an optimization problem. Then finally, they want to solve this optimization problem to get their traffic signal operation. So in this case, actually the decision is a static function of the traffic data. Compared to this, uh, what we do in the recent years is actually more like a data-driven methods. Uh, different from the, uh, from the transportation methods actually here, uh, we directly learn the decision from the real world data. That is also one of the key idea of reinforcement learning, right? So we, we basically do not need any assumption from the data we directly let the algorithm learn from it. So based on the observation of the dynamic traffic today, actually uh, we want to claim that the data-driven methods can serve us better. If we want to put the traffic signal control in this reinforcement learning setting or say in this data-driven setting, one general framework could be done like this. So we first need to come up with an environment which is consistent of the uh, traffic signal and the situation at the intersections. Then we try to generate a observation from the environment, which usually describes, okay, how many cars are ending up on this intersection and what's the current signal phase. So based on this state, uh, we will generate, uh, uh, generate our algorithm, which will decide what is the next action to this environment. So after that, we will get the word back to the agent, which is describing whether the, uh, whether the current decision is working well or, uh, or not. So, uh, here we, we give some brief definition or some options for defining the reward action and state. Uh, one more thing we want to discuss here is that uh, although we all know that we want to define the reward to measure whether we are making the traffic faster or not, it is really hard to define this. So some people may ask, okay, I can come up of a lot of different measurements to measure this reward. But why are you saying that it is difficult to do that? So here I just gave out some examples on defining the reward function, uh, which may consist like queue length, number of vehicles, a waiting time, a throughput, or delay, or even I can use a traffic image to construct further measurements uh, on, on the status of the 
traffic signal control. So we come up with a few measurements. How should we combine or how should we define the reward in the end? A simple conclusion or simple hit into my mind would be, okay, can we use a combination of these different measurements as a reward function? That's exactly what we did in our first trial of this, of this question. Uh, we, we make a really complex reward function, which is consisting of four parts. Uh, and we tried to use this rule function to do the reinforcement learning to solve this traffic signal control problem. But however, uh, actually without carefully tuning, using this method cannot even outperform a simple baseline. Okay, what's the baseline? Uh, so the baseline raised by the transportation experts is actually pretty intuitive. First, uh, they will get the hourly historical traffic flow count for each lane. Then uh, they will calculate the signal cycle using a formula. This formula is raised like 20 years ago. Then based on this formula, uh, after they calculating the uh, signal cycle, they will try to split the green time to different traffic flows by their ratio. For example, here we have the traffic ratio as three versus seven. Then I will divide the total green time into three versus seven, these portions. So this is a really simple baseline, but uh, if we directly do the reinforcement learning with not carefully designed reward function, actually we cannot even outperform this simple baseline. So we wonder why this is happening and what is wrong with our reward function. Then after carefully uh, proof and design, we, we actually uh, come up into a new idea that we want to match the traditional transportation knowledge with our reward function design in this reinforcement learning setting. So in the transportation engineering, actually, uh, what the previous equation is optimizing is it wants to optimize the travel time given some constraints. Uh, this constraint usually is based on the design of the traffic signal so that uh, they will uh, make sure the pedestrian has the enough time to pass through the intersection. So let's first ignore those constraints. So if we want to minimize the travel time, then one quick question comes up. Why don't we just directly use the travel time as a measurement? So I will leave this question uh, behind uh, because of the time. But actually a quick answer to this is that the travel time measurement is a long-term effect. Uh, say if your travel time of a vehicle is having say 10 minutes, then during this 10 minutes, actually a lot of actions may have effect on this travel time. So it is hard to do this reward assignment if you use travel time as a reward function. So our Solution here is actually we uh, through through some assumption on the traffic model, uh, we successfully prove that using another me measurement, which is Q lens, is actually uh, equivalent to optimizing travel time. In addition, Q lens actually is better evaluated than travel time in terms of the reward assignment because. QLens is relatively an instant measure. So finally, we actually use this QLens as our reward function, and we do experiments on different data sets on different cities. Here we compare the methods, uh, which is from 
the transportation methods and the RL methods and our proposed final method LEAT, uh, which stands for lightweight traffic signal control. So actually the formula here is a method, the simple baseline I mentioned before. And the entirely light here actually is the first method we raised uh, previously. So uh, this entirely light actually combines different reward function while the lead actually only use the QLens as reward function. We can see that actually lead outperform all the other methods, even the complex version. So that really makes us think that we, before doing all this uh, reinforcement learning stuff, we really need to think about this question and try to design the reward function really carefully. So this method lead basically helps us solve the one simple intersection, but our, our problem is actually far beyond solving a simple intersection. Let's try to generalize this intersection into this version. So here we have a four-way intersection uh, with each way having the left turn through and right turn movement. Uh, for most of the country, because vehicles are running on the right, and also uh, the right turn movement is not controlled by the traffic signal. So uh, we are focusing more on the other eight directions. I mean, the left turn and through movement on each direction. So if we think about the state space to represent this intersection, if we use the number of vehicles and the phase, uh, which is a current uh, traffic signal phase on this intersection to, rep to represent it. So the total space of, the, of this intersection is like this. Assume there are at most n vehicles for each direction uh, because we have eight bit here. And for the phase in total, uh, we will show uh, later that uh, we actually have in total eight phases here. So the state space is going to be this large. Let's say n equals to 40. Then we can say that this number is going to be really large. So it's just for one single intersection, we will have this large state space. Considering the action space, we will have a more even larger exploration space in total. Now, how should we solve this question in, in terms of this large exploration space? Actually, we first think about why this exploration space becomes this large. Let's first think about a really simple case where in the morning, we travel from the west to the east. Well, in the afternoon, after work, actually, you travel from the opposite direction. So do we think these two cases are the same from the human perspective? If the other traffic conditions are similar under these two scenarios. Say in the morning, uh, a lot of people travel from this direction, while in the evening, uh, a lot of people travel in the opposite direction. Then to us, these two scenarios are actually really similar. However, if we define this problem, define the state according to the previous definition, these two scenarios will be represented by different vectors because every bit, every uh, position of the vector is important to this feature representation. So based on this observation, actually we want to find the minimum environment unit in this problem. Say if we can represent this direction without consideration of the concrete position in this, in this intersection. 
then we can extract uh, this direction without consideration on the relative relation between those different directions. So that's how we design our model actually. So before introducing the model details, we first try to define uh, what is a phase, what is a movement uh, for better understanding. <coughs> Sorry. So in this four -way intersection, so in total, we have eight different movement signals and we can combine those signals into different phases. Uh, we have a simple conflict matrix here showing that actually only certain pairs of the movement signal can be combined. Otherwise, they will be conflicted. For example, uh, the phase A, which combines one and five, they can be combined. However, if we want to combine one and two, they will conflict with each other. So by observing this conflict matrix, actually there are in total eight valid phases considering this eight traffic signal. Well, uh, some people may say, okay, I can still enumerating some single movement signal. Like I just let the signal one pass. Uh, however, <clears throat> uh, as long as there is no congestion in the downstream, usually all the signal will let at least two traffic signal pass. Otherwise, this is a waste of the time because we'll let the left turn on this direction pass. Uh, it's better for you to combine that with this rule or this left turn. So after defining the phase, now we have a minimum invariant unit phase to represent the state. Before we actually try to represent the situation in terms of each lane, that's why our feature representation is, uh, <coughs> is re related to the position of this lane in this intersection. However, currently, if we represent all the stuff in terms of the phase, then fi the final decision on which phase to, to have a green signal is actually becoming a computation between the eight phases. So that's our basic intuition for our model design here. Uh, we first combine the feature representation for different uh, traffic movements into phases. Then we combine each pair of phase. Uh, previously we mentioned we have phase A through H, right? So here we combine them pairwisely. After we have this pair computation representation, we actually just need to enumerate all the different computation pairs and try to consider whether phase A is more favored compared to phase H. So basically we do this comparison among each pair that forms this volume. Then we do a convolution uh, because this feature representation learning should be shared among different pairs. So after several layers of this convolution, uh, we actually get a score, which is a pairwise competition score. That basically means whether phase A should be considered more than phase H. So after summing up all the uh, all the score in this row, which is basically comparing phase A with B, phase A with C, phase A with H, then we will have a priority score for phase A. Then finally, by comparing the phase score for each phase, we will decide which phase should be given the green time. Okay, so if we observe 
carefully on this whole structure, you can see that actually because we try to define this traffic movement instead of the then, our structure here actually it can adapt to any intersection structure, any number of lanes, and any phase settings. No matter you are a three-way intersection, four-way or five-way, no matter how many lanes you have in each direction, this framework can handle them all. So you may wonder, uh, we design such a complex model, how does it perform on the data set? Yeah, we, we do the experiments uh, again on different cities and we compare with uh, traditional methods and, trans uh, and the reinforcement learning methods. Our FRAP here uh, is performing better than all the other baselines. Uh, we also compare the methods with other methods in terms of the convergence speed. I create our FRAP converges much faster. Uh, another Advantage of this method is actually uh, it is agnostic to different road structures, as mentioned before. No matter your three-way, four-way, no matter how many lanes you are having on each intersection. Okay, after that, actually, we have been doing something uh, aiming for a bigger city. Like previously, we are more talking about this problem in terms of how to solve this one intersection more elegantly. Well, here uh, we are trying to apply it to a larger world. Like we consider the multi-agent communication through a graph attentional network. The basic intuition here is that we will consider the traffic signal of the concerned intersection. You may want to consider both the upstream and the downstream intersection as well. Say the downstream intersection, if there is a congestion in the downstream, then there will be no need for you to let the vehicle through. Uh, for the upstream, it's more like a forecast for you. Uh, if you have a lot of vehicles on the upstream, then probably in the next few minutes, you should give a green time to the downstream. But besides that, actually, uh, we have been doing something about the knowledge transfer. Uh, we all know that in the real world, it is really risky for you to directly train the reinforcement learning methods, especially that for, for the traffic signal control problem. Uh, if we make some wrong decisions in the real world, uh, that will cause the real traffic congestion. And this will be converted to the real economic loss numbers, right? So uh, that's why we thought about how can we use minimum data to train this model. One thinking is that, can we borrow some knowledge from the trained model to an untrained area? So uh, based on this motivation, actually we do a meta light, which is using meta reinforcement learning technique to transfer the knowledge from one city to the other. Well, uh, based on the previous studies, actually we finally tried to apply this framework on a larger scale, a city scale control. We do an experiment on the Manhattan 2,500 traffic lights. Uh, this is one of the biggest traffic signal control experiment that has been done so far. So we have been talking so much about how to learn this policy. Uh, well, when we try to apply this in the real world, one key question is that, uh, okay, you are training this from a simulation or putting in the data into the simulation. But between the simulation and the real world, there is still a gap. So next, we will briefly talk about how to try, how to mitigate this gap. So when we apply the learned policy in the real world, like it is like uh, we are using uh, a simulated world to approximate the real world. 
we may wonder, can we directly apply the policy learned from the simulator and put into the real world and do some online update? Well, actually this might be a natural idea to do this. However, this is really risky uh, because what we do in the real world will cause the real cost now. So our solution here is actually uh, a little bit different from this solution. So we try to think about this problem more like a parallel world. I, I think most of the people here uh, might he have heard games like Skylines or uh, like uh, City Scene. So all these games, they are trying to construct a parallel world uh, from the real world. So that's the similar situation we are having now. We actually have the trajectory data, we have the traffic signal records, we have the traffic camera data. We have all this data, but how should we construct a simulated world from those data? That's a key question we want to ask. So that's why we conducted this work, which is learn to simulate driver behaviors. Uh, we want to use a framework which is called Gale, Generative Adversarial Imitation Learning, to learn how people is driving in the real world. So in this framework, actually, we have two parts. One part is a generator, which is a policy. Or the other part is a discriminator, which basically tells you whether the current policy is different from the ground truth policy. So here, the basic flow is like this. Every time step, your generator is going to generate the traffic behavior of the, of the vehicles, like whether the vehicle is going to speed up or decelerate based on the distance to the front vehicle and the distance to the traffic signal. Then this will form the generated trajectory. Then the discriminator will try to discriminate the generated trajectory from the expert trajectory. While this discrimination process will give some feedback to the generator to further optimize the generation process. So how does this work? Uh, here we give a brief illustration on the generated trajectories. So we give the trajectories of five vehicles and uh, the expert one is on the right. So here we basically plot the trajectories uh, in terms of the time. Uh, each dot represents one second. Uh, so those dots basically represents the position of the vehicles at each, each second. Therefore, if we can recover the trajectory that is most close to the expert trajectory, then that is saying this method is better than the others, right? So if we observe all the methods here, like the CFM methods, they are traditional transportation methods, uh, and the behavior cloning, deep IRL, these methods are imitation learning methods. Uh, L2S is our method. So we can see that actually our method is performing much better than the other methods in terms of recovering the true trajectory. Okay, so that's basically how we want to learn the traffic driving behavior of the vehicles. So after talking so much about uh, what we have been done so far, what we have been done before, Actually, uh, here I want to introduce an opportunity to all of you guys to try it yourself. Uh, here, actually, uh, we, we are hosting the KDD Cup this year. Uh, I think most of you have been uh, contacted with KDD Cup. KDD Cup is the most prestigious <coughs> data science competition that is hosted by KDD. And usually in the recent years, there will be more than 1,000 participants every year. And this year we're hosting the City Brain Challenge. 
uh, aiming for a efficient traffic coordination strategy. Sorry. So why we want to do this KDD Cup challenge this year is actually from the real world motivation about the traffic congestion. So given this, uh, here, I, I just show you some numbers about two big cities in the real world, Tokyo and New York City. So we can observe that actually uh, Tokyo is having about 43% more vehicles than the New York City. While Tokyo actually achieves this with only like 30% more road network and 15% of more traffic signals. So those numbers remind us of the question that, is there a capacity for this whole city? If there is, what is the capacity? How many vehicles can we put into the New York City if we don't want people to move too slow? Say, if we want to make sure people are running at at least 20 miles per hour, then can we input, uh, say, 500,000 vehicles into the New York City? Or can we have 1 million vehicles into the New York City? So that is basically the question we want to answer here. To make this problem happen, we actually try to do this in the traffic signal control perspective. So we are having a city scale road network with more than 1,000 intersections. We will give you the road network, give you the traffic flow. And our objective is ask all the participants to maximize the total number of vehicles served. We are optimizing the traffic signal control setting. So this whole competition is going to have three stages. A first stage, uh, actually it has already passed. Uh, we, we have asked all the participants to practice with the regional road network. And currently we are, we are at the qualification stage. Uh, each part participant will deal with the city scale road network. And uh, actually we are having another deadline, which is May 20. Uh, we ask all the participants to register before this deadline. So it's only one week to go. So it, it's really the time to get started and register for this computation. And for the final stage, uh, we are going to uh, have a large scale cloud computing platform provided. So previously in different computations, usually uh, people need to use their own computation resources to achieve a better score. And we all know that when we try to design these large scale reinforcement learning problems, uh, the computation resources is really are really important. Like, uh, uh, like all the big models now we are training, like uh, BERT, like GPT-3, they are all trained in a big cluster of machines. So that's also one of the highlight point of our computation here. So if you are entering the final stage of this computation, uh, you will be given the chance to use our large cluster of computation resource. And here actually uh, to support this computation, uh, actually, we are using a really high efficiency simulation environment, which can support more than 1,000 intersections and 100,000 vehicles in real time, which basically means if we run one second uh, in the real world, that will take one second in the simulation. As far as we know, this is the fastest traffic simulation in, in the world right now, okay? And we also provide the large scale computing support, which has been described before. So in order to join this computation, 
uh, you, you are free to uh, contact us or click the link, which I will be sending out uh, in, in the Zoom session later. Okay, thank you. That's all I want to share today. Okay, thank you. Have any questions? Yeah. I think uh, the Roger can start to discuss it, then people can ask afterwards. People ask the questions. Roger. Oh, Roger, okay. it's your turn. Okay, yeah, I have unmuted. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It's been uh, very interesting. Uh, I've been knowledgeable of reinforced learning for a long time, actually. I believe the first papers were from 10, 10 to 12 years ago. And it's, it's good to see that uh, this field keeps improving uh, over time, and especially uh, seeing that it tackles the, the full problem question of the whole network, not just individual junctions, but the whole thing. Uh, from a DD smart transportation point of view, uh, what we do is that we have this pro vehicle data, which uh, and it's large scale pro vehicle data, which covers vehicles, uh, it co covers uh, cities uh, at, at a cheap cost. However, the, the, the quality of the data, it, it requires a high effort on feature engineering. Something that it wasn't clear in this, in this presentation is how did you treat the, the trajectory data that you had and which efforts did you do on feature engineering? Uh, you mean for my question, how did I do the feature engineer? Yes, yes, more details on the feature engineering. Because yeah, sure. it's actually the, the challenging part of using trajectory data. Yes, 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 that's true. So uh, actually, uh, I, I will answer this question in this way. So, so previously, uh, what we do, like when we first come up with this question using the reinforced learning to solve the traffic signal control problem, uh, what we uh, what we do in our mind is actually uh, we put all the features we can thought about we thought about into the state, and we use very complex state features like uh, the image representation of this intersection. So basically, we do uh, encoding on the vehicles. Uh, whether the, we we divide the whole intersection into pixels, like say. When each resolution, each pixel is three by three meters or say five by five meters. So basically one pixel represents whether there is a car here or not. Uh, this is a way that has been done in the literature actually. Uh, we tried different combinations of those features, but finally we found directly combining those features does not work well. Uh, so that's why we try to think more deeply uh, from the root of this core uh, of this problem. That's also why we come into this research, come into this problem. Uh, we think about why we are having this large feature space or say state space in this problem. That is because we are not considering the, uh, the property in this intersection. Actually, uh, these two cases, as I mentioned before, they are symmetric, right? Actually, we have a lot of symmetric or similar cases. Say I can rotate this concerned direction to different directions. If we represent the feature uh, regarding to the position of this direction, so all this different rotation version or flipped version or any other translation version, uh, these are different representations and will lead to different feature vectors. So, so you see here, actually, without considering this symmetry, symmetry, we are doing this feature representation in creating duplicate data samples, right? So that's one of the way how we do this feature representation. Basically, we, want, we find the minimum Environment unit, which is a phase. And finally, we uh, convert the feature representation problem 
to the competition among those faces. Yeah, I think that's uh, the way how we do the feature learning here. Does that answer your question? So, I mean, my question is, uh, if, you, if you use trajectory data from the real world, right? Like Hangzhou and these cities, yes. uh, how did you actually clean the data? I mean, if it's probical data from GPS, it has errors, it has to be map matched. Uh, how did you treat this data? Okay, okay, that's your question. Yeah, so uh, the trajectory data actually, uh, okay, uh, uh, let me first make a clarification. So we are using the trajectory data, we are using the camera data and the road network data. For the trajectory data and the camera data, when we do the experiments on the traffic signal control, uh, so we are uh, only using the aggregated data to do this experiment because we do not care that much, uh, okay, what is this vehicle is exactly? But we care how much how many vehicles are passing through this intersection and that intersection. So uh, that's how we treat that data. But uh, uh, as for the question you are asking, uh, like whether there is any error uh, or misrepresentation in the trajectory data, uh, we do do some prune uh, on this trajectory data. Like uh, we we do some proven by using the distance calculation. Sometimes, you know, uh, in, in, some, in some of our trajectory data, we do observe that uh, one vehicle is here uh, for this moment. Well, it appears uh, in, in another place, which is like 10 kilometers away in the next 10 seconds. So that is apparently impossible. Uh, in the real world, right? <laughs> so uh, we do do some this kind of cleaning on this trajectory data by using this kind of techniques. Uh, okay. Yeah, apart from this, I don't remember quite a lot details okay. about it. Yeah. And, and this, this data sets, uh, the, the trajectory data set has full penetration rate or partial? And if you use camera data and trajectory, how did you do the data fusion? Okay, okay, I see your question. Yeah, yeah, this is a really good question. Actually, we have been having another work which is published at ICD this year, uh, which is during this data fusion problem. So basically we have the trajectory data, we have the speed data, we have the camera, which is converted to the volume data. Those data, they are all sparse in terms of time and locations. So uh, in that work, actually what we do to convert uh, to fusion those data is that we build a conversion chain from trajectory to volume on, on the row segments to speed. And we use other sparse data like, like the volume data, they can constrain the intermediate variables. Well, for the speed data, because it's much easier to observe the speed uh, in a full observation, because it can be easily obtained from the map services like Google Maps. So we assume that data is relatively rich. And for the other sparse data, uh, we use them to constrain this conversion chain so that we can recover all the stuff in this chain. That, that's how our work for, for that study. But for, for the studies here, which I, I've been talking about today, for the traffic signal control problem, uh, actually, uh, we only fusion the trajectory data and the volume data. The way we, how to, the way we do this is because the trajectory data usually is only some representative groups of the other vehicles like taxis or ride holding vehicles. So they only take up to like 5% of the total vehicles uh, running on the road. So we will use the volume data to multiply or say amplify this 
trajectory data. So that's how we basically fusion them in this question. Okay, uh, thanks for, for the answer. Uh, another uh, uh, question I have, uh, you have mentioned you have uh, benchmarks here. One was fixed time and the other one was formula. Could you please provide more details on these benchmarks? Uh, you mean this method, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so the fixed time, fixed time method is basically using the uh, historical uh, historical traffic to calculate, uh, to select a fixed time table for uh, for the different uh, traffic signal phases. Like we mentioned here, uh, we, we are actually having eight different phases. So we basically use a fixed timetable. Like for phase A, I have 30 seconds green time. Phase B, 30 seconds. Phase three, 40 seconds. Phase D, 20 seconds, like this. So for the formula one, uh, the formula method is a method that I mentioned before, uh, where the, the basic logic is that you first look at the historical traffic of different directions. Then we first try to compute a signal cycle according to this traffic. Uh, here is a, is it, uh, the basic intuition between, uh, behind this formula is that actually larger traffic will require a larger signal cycle because every transition of the traffic signal phase will cause some loss, like the, the old red time between every, uh, every two traffic signal phase. And also for the first few seconds of the green light, actually uh, it's also wasted because people need time to get started. So considering all this loss of time, of green time, so uh, this formula is actually calculating the minimum cycle length that can fulfill this traffic demand. So after calculating this uh, traffic signal cycle, uh, we will split the green time according to the demand of different phases. Yeah. So Does you didn't do any, any coordination then? I mean... No, for this method, they do not have any coordination. And for, for this comparison and for the comparison here, oh, sorry. For, for this comparison, it's on both uh, multi-intersection and single intersection. And for, for this comparison, it's on multi-intersection. But actually, uh, our experience is that coordination is important when the traffic is relatively huge, which means your upstream will have a significant impact on your downstream. If the traffic is relatively light, say it's not fully congested, then as long as each of the intersections, it can do their own job, then the system should work fine. I mean, it, it, there is still room to improve, but this should achieve like 80% of the optimal performance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you consider your model to be pure model free? Or at some point you use some traffic model within the, within the whole uh, uh, framework? I think it, it is purely model free. If you are referring to model model based and model free reinforcement learning, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we do not have the state transition model here. Okay. And my other concern is more from a practical point of view. Uh, which could be the development time of doing a real world project on this? Okay. I mean, because uh, traffic signal control systems are highly constrained, okay? Uh, let's say that signal timing will only get you that far on it. Um, <clears throat> else the system becomes unstable and you get spillover for, for very large volumes and for very low volumes. I mean, semi-actuated control already performs uh, uh, good enough. Um, <clears throat> so which, which could be the, the, the development time of this and which, which is the actual 
um, let's say, uh, scenarios with this reinforcement learning would perform the best? Mm, I didn't fully get your question. Are you asking that uh, considering all the constraints, like uh, minimum time of the green time, this, this kind of constraints, uh, would the RL method still perform well? Are you asking this? Well, the, the constraints are the same. I mean, green, minimum greens are for pedestrian generally, yeah, crossing yeah, times, yes. so they, they yeah. don't depend on the method. But I'm asking wh where this reinforcement learning would perform the best. I mean, for very low, low traffics, semi-actuated control is already optimal, okay? Uh, okay, which is at okay. Night. okay. Uh, for very congested uh, areas where there's very little room, uh, cycle length, I mean, uh, fixed time plus queue management, it's much we can do. Obviously, in, not in, in, in connected automated vehicle environments. Yeah? I mean, talking in, in human driver environments. Yeah. yeah so yeah, the question yeah. is, uh, where does these reinforcement learning tools would perform the best? Which could be their niche? Okay. Uh, their okay. niche scenario. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I see your point. Yeah. yeah I think you, you just uh, make a really uh, good summary or good uh, projection that uh, actually at the small traffic scenario, there is little improvement space. Like say, uh, if you are driving in the United States, you will know that uh, a lot of the traffic signals at the intersection, which is one small road and a big road, then uh, during midnight, the traffic light, the green light is always on the on the large uh, on the bigger road, right? Uh, as when a, a vehicle when a vehicle arrives at the intersection on the small road, then the green light actually will start counting, and finally give you a green light to go. So under this kind of case, I mean, uh, when the traffic is really light, actually there is no. I would say there is not too much improvement room. Well, under larger traffic, say it is fully congested, I don't think there is still room to improve because say uh, the traditional methods, no matter it is a formula or uh, other methods, SOTR actually is a rule-based method and some other frequently used method like the pressure-based method, which basically considers the Q length difference between the upstream and the downstream. Yeah, so all these traditional methods, they are somehow still rule-based and they cannot deal with the dynamic traffic. That's one point where reinforcement learning might perform better. The other point is that uh, for these extreme cases, I don't think reinforcement learning methods can try to learn the extreme cases. Like say, we, we know this area is already fully congested and you may have to sacrifice some of the directions and let some of the directions go first. In this case, I, I mean, uh, we, we usually we do not have this regulated experience of, of this kind of scenarios. What we solve in the real world right now is that we put a police officer into the intersection and that let the police officer decide, okay, which direction I want to let go first. But we do not have a systematic method describing this. Uh, one related area might be a uh, micros microscopic fundamental diagram, uh, which is a relatively classic theory in transportation. That is talking about the uh, regional wise control. Uh, you, you are viewing the question in a regional wise level rather than one intersection. So in this case, uh, we may, use the reinforcement learning method to learn this kind of extreme cases. 
I think actually that's a really uh, useful direction because uh, usually what will cause the severe jam or cause the feeling of people to downgrade really fast it is these extreme cases. For the normal hours, I mean, if you improve 10% of the travel time, okay, that's good, but people may not have that strong feeling, okay, it's improving. But if you can improve the extreme case with 5%, maybe that's a lot for, for, for improving people's feeling. I think yeah. that in, in order to be fair, uh, the bank marks uh, should be include uh, model predictive control, especially since you use camera data. I think it would be yeah. much more fair than using this uh, formula or this fixed time uh, bank marks. Yes, okay. yeah. Okay, it's not that tough to code. I mean, you can get the COP algorithm or that from roads. And even if you don't coordinate or just do it purely decentralized or dis yeah. distributed, let's call it, uh, I think it could be fair to call it uh, to model predictive control. Because I mean, the other question that I, that I had is about the development time is how long does it take this to learn, especially when you move away from simulation environments. So this is where these uh, reinforcement learning tools, I think that would be the, the weakest on that. So if, yeah. if the development time, even if this reinforcement learning can detect uh, richer scenarios eventually, if the development time of these reinforcement learning techniques is too long, then the model predictive control uh, could still be more efficient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, and, models like model predictive control is usually more, uh, it's usually a safe choice rather than compared to, to reinforcement learning. Yeah. Another uh, question least, I have is, yeah. is how does your system performance uh, depend on the uncertainty of traffic state simulation? This is actually the, the largest problem we have at DD since uh, most of our projects work on just pro vehicle data. This means that we have a very partial uh, observation of our of our states. Uh, how well could you do with, with just uh, partial pro vehicle data? I mean, have you done any sensitivity on penetration rate? Uh, no, we we uh, for, for the traffic signal control problem, we are assuming that we have the full observation here. Yeah, but what you are mentioning that uh, when we have partial observation of the traffic status. Uh, can we still control the traffic signal? Well, uh, that's that's what we are thinking about actually. Uh, actually, when we try to design this computation problem, we we do think, think about that problem that we only give you say 10% of the observation in the city. Can you still control the traffic signal? Yeah. Okay, so you plan to put it in the competition. I think it's a very interesting problem because this is actually what we do at Didi. And it's more than the control problem. Our problem is the traffic state estimation. And also the, the after uh, the, the experiment to evaluate if what we did was good or not, because we still have partial observation. So it's more about statistics than control, what we find at Didi. But yeah, I mean, of course, we, we eventually need to do the control, right? That's what we are being paid for. But the yeah. traffic state estimation is our big, big deal here. Yes. Okay, so uh, from my part, I don't have any, any further questions. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, good to see this field evolving. And let's hope that with all these competitions and further research, uh, we can eventually make it happen. So thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, see you. So do we have any other question from other speak uh, other audience or uh, no we don't have any other questions now okay so is that the end for today i think it is thank okay you. okay cool cool thank you thank you dr drew thank you Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye, Roger. Okay.